And we uh, have a final speaker, who, someone who really needs very little in the way of introduction, author, critic, journalist, and authorship question um, expert. Alexander War is about to speak to us. However, before he does, uh, let me introduce Sonnet 72. Oh, lest the world should task you to recite what merit lived in me that you should love after my death. Dear love, forget me quite, for you in me can nothing worthy prove. Unless you would devise some virtuous lie to do more for me than mine own desert and hang more praise upon deceased eye than niggard truth would willingly impart. Oh, lest your true love may seem false in this, that you for love speak well of me untrue, my name be buried where my body is, and live no more to shame, nor me, nor you. For I am shamed by that which I bring forth, and so should you, to love things nothing worth. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Richard. Most of the sonnets are addressed to an unnamed, beautiful, narcissistic youth, some to an unnamed, a dark lady mistress, and some, it is argued, to an unnamed, newborn babe. It is in sonnets that Shakespeare reveals his reputation and social standing to be in tatters. He claims that his name has received a brand. He is despised, shamed and vile esteemed in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes. Has made himself a motley to the view. He feels all alone and beweeps his outcast state. He suffers a bewailed guilt because of a vulgar scandal stamped upon his brow. His name is so dishonoured, so disdained, that he believes it should be erased from the record. If you read this line, remember not the hand that writ it. In me, each part will be forgotten. No longer mourn me when I am dead. Do not so much as my poor name rehearse, for I once gone to all the world must die. And as we've just heard after my death, forget me quite. My name be buried where my body is and live no more to shame, nor me, nor you note. He's dragging in the so-called fair youth, who's obviously caught up in this scandal, and it's suggested in several of the times in Sonnet 34, for instance, the reader discovers that the youth has suffered shame and has repented his ill deeds, for which the poet somehow bears a responsibility. The youth is blamed and slandered by people passing lascivious comments on his wantonness. So clearly there is a, a crashing scandal going on here. What is it? Well, it's not overtly stated in the sonnets, but clearly calling a narcissistic young man a rose and pleading with him to procreate for love of me is certainly scandalous in itself. And so too is sharing a mistress with said narcissistic young rose man. I don't think any of that is controversial, despite the fact that nearly everything you say otherwise about the sonnets is controversial. Now, a sharp critic of the man who wrote uh, the uh, Venus and Adonis said of him, long as the crafty cuttle lieth sure in the black cloud of his thick vomiture, who lists complain of wronged faith or fame when he may shift it onto another's name? What he seems to be saying here is that uh, this uh, author is hiding his name and washing his own dirty linen in public. He is talking of the author of Venus and Adonis. One only has to look, I think, at the front cover to get some clue that that man, Joseph Hall, who wrote that attack on Shakespeare, uh, was along the right lines. We have a Latin tag here uh, from Ovid which is often translated, let the rabble delight in trash. Vilia could be trash, minor little things, uh, rubbish. Uh, let the rabble delight in trash. May Apollo serve me full cups of Castalian water. I don't think I'm being too controversial then to interpret that. Let the rabble delight in the tittle tattle while I dignify the matter 
in lofty Apollonian verse. He's telling us, I think, right here on the front cover, that this poem is about some sort of contemporary scandal. Is there more clue on this title page what this scandal is? Well, yes, it's called Venus and Adonis. Venus, we know, uh, stands for love and sex. So there's a bit of a clue. And Adonis, well, you only have to read uh, the sonnets that we've just been talking about and what is said about the fair youth. He is compared directly to Adonis. He is described as a beautiful, young, rose-cheeked narcissist who is urged to procreate. Now, if you read this poem, Venus and Adonis, you'll find that Adonis is described as a beautiful, young, rose-cheeked narcissist who is urged to procreate. So the suggestion that the fair youth of the sonnets has absolutely nothing to do with Adonis is, to me at least, totally absurd. If we look above the title there, we see not Venus, but Juno, the goddess of riches, fertility, pregnancy, and childbirth. Are these clues to the great scandal that has ostracized Shakespeare um, from, from the life of the court, the life of people whom he respects, has made him a motley to the view? Well, we only have to turn the page, and here we see the famous dedication to Henry Rosalie, Earl of Southampton, who we think may be the fair youth, in which case he's wrapped up in this scandal. Is there anything here, perhaps, if we just dig a little bit below, below the surface that suggests um, some sort of scandal of fertility, pregnancy, and childbirth? Let's just pluck out a few words here. We have the word lines in the second line. If you go to the Oxford English Dictionary, that's chiefly with reference to family descent, a series in which each member is the parent of the one next following. The word prop is meant to mean penis in the dictionary of um, uh, sexual language and imagery in Shakespeare and literature. We have the name, uh, the word burthen here, that which is born in the womb. The word labor, the process of childbirth. The word heir, that which is begotten, offspring, Deformed, which means pregnant, as you probably know, in Two Gentlemen of Verona, Shakespeare twice uses the word deformed to mean pregnant. We have the word ear, which means to copulate, to inseminate. Look at, son uh, at Sonnet 3 if you're unsure about that definition. The word barren, of women, bearing no children. Then this extraordinary sentence here, if the first heir of my invention proved deformed, I shall be sorry it had so noble a godfather. He is directly there calling the Earl of Southampton, Rosalie, the noble godfather to the poet's first heir. If we look at the last four words here, the world's hopeful expectation. What, if you went to an intelligent person that the time was published would be meant by the world's hopeful expectation. Well, clearly it is the second coming, the coming of Jesus Christ, the coming of the son, expectation of a son. And this uh, uh, ties uh, very precisely to the first words of the paired dedication to Southampton in Lucrece. Here again, we have riches, fertility, pregnancy, and childbirth. And of course the name Lucrece, which means rich. It comes from the Latin lucrum, um, um, and that's where we get the word uh, uh, lucrative from, etc. or filthy lucas. So let's just have a look at the first sentence of that paired dedication. The love I dedicate to your lordship is without end, whereof this pamphlet without beginning is but a superfluous moiety. So what love is there that is without end and without beginning? Of course, it's the eternal love of the father. So the first sentence, of the second dedication is tying very much to the last sentence of the first dedication, which alludes to the coming of the son. Now, is it possible then that this young Henry Rosalie is wrapped up in some appalling scandal, um, that he's actually uh, fathered the son that is there being presented as the father of the poet. What I have done is yours, what I have to do is yours, being part in all I have devoted yours, were my worth greater, my duty would show greater, Meantime, as it is, it is bound to your lordship. Well, if you wish to interpret that in another way, I think it's jolly easy to interpret that as a person who is going to bring up a son that is in fact not his, but is the dedicatee of this uh, particular work. What did contemporaries have to say about this? The encomium um, to Lady Pecunia. I hope you can see the top of that there. The word pecunious, of course, means rich. If you want to turn uh, pecunious into a name and feminize it, you would call it pecunia. So encomium of 
Lady Rich, you could call this. And indeed, this book is full, published in 1598, of vicious barbed attacks on a certain uh, jolly um, racy courtier called Lady Rich. It also contains a few lines on Shakespeare. Venus, Lucrece, sweet and chaste, thy name in fame's immortal book have placed. Live ever you, at least in fame, live ever. Well may the body die, but fame die never. Well, you may think that's very nice. He's just, he's just being extremely praiseworthy to this, this poet. But is he? Look carefully at the poem and you see twice on two consecutive lines, in fames and in fame. You only have to go to the Oxford English Dictionary to find that in fame means infamy of ill fame, infamous, an infamous person, one branded with infamy, to render infamous, to brand with infamy or dishonor, to hold up to infamy, to reprobate, etc. When you start looking at the uh, allusions to Shakespeare in the 1590s, you find they're all absolutely onto this. This wasn't a scandal that was written about in the sonnets and then totally vanished. He's made a motley to the view. Well, that means everybody knew about it. They may not have been able to say it, but they jolly well knew about it. This work called Polymantia published just one year after uh, Shakespeare's Lucrece. And it's always been a, a curiosity for people interested in the authorship question because uh, Sweet Shakespeare appears as a march in a letter addressed from England to her three daughters, Oxford, Cambridge and the Inns of Court. William Shakespeare of Stratford, of course, had absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with Oxford, Cambridge or the Inns of Court. So what is his name doing here on this margin note? Perhaps it's not helped when you looked at the sheer gobbledygook that it's set next to. And unless I err, a thing easy in such simplicity, deluded by dearly beloved Delia and fortunately fortunate Cleopatra, Oxford thou mayst extol thy court dear verse, happy Daniel, whose sweet refined muse in contracted shape were sufficient amongst men to gain pardon of the sin to Rosamond, pity to distressed Cleopatra, and ever living praise to her loving Delia. Register your children's pedigree in fame's forehead. Well, I hope you all understood that very clearly. If you work hard at it, there is actually a surface meaning that isn't too bad, but you can tell straight away from extraordinary little statements like sweet refined muse in contracted shape that we're dealing with some sort of um, encrypted hidden message here, a, a crossword puzzle, if you like, and you only have to start looking certain tags such as sin, uh, wanton Adonis, uh, register your children's pedigree, infames, forehead. Well, we've talked about infames. Um, when you put things in foreheads, particularly children's pedigrees, what are pedigrees? They are, they are trees, they are branches, they are horns. When you start putting trees, branches and horns onto foreheads, then you're talking about cuckoldry and all sorts of sexual uh, mischief. So is this possibly about the very same scandal that we find in the uh, Shakespeare sonnets that we see seems to be referred to in Venus and Adonis. Can we identify from this the, uh, the fair youth, the dark lady and the poet Shakespeare? Are there three such scoundrels here? Well, you can probably see three names set in almost a perfect triangle there, right in the center of the text band, dead center. Let's have a look a bit more closely at those three names I might be alluding to. Well, Delia is Samuel Daniel's uh, poems of Delia. And Samuel Daniel says, I wrote them to myself. He talks about trying to kiss Delia and getting splashed with cold water in his face. What's going on here is he's talking about a narcissist. It's no coincidence that Delia is practically a perfect anagram of Daniel. In fact, a Delia would be a perfect anagram. But if you now understand that and look at those poems, you'll realize how witty and how clever they are because they are writing about a narcissist who is sitting by the water and looking at his own reflection. Now we know that uh, Adonis was described as a narcissist, the fair youth is described as a narcissist, and the Earl of Southampton, Henry Rosalie, is also described as a narcissist. If we look how Delia has been given a little margin note, all praiseworthy, how silly is that? Well, it's a perfect anagram of Paral dot, Paral dot Rosalie. I've come across Paral dot, I'm sure many of you have, who've looked at old books. It's very, very common indeed in margin notes. And it means parallel or equivalent to the same as, you see it time and time again. So here we have a very clever little joke here. We have Delia, the narcissist, 
and we are being told here that he is the parallel, the equivalent of Rosalie. We seem to have found the fair youth very useful. Can we find the dark lady? Well, yes, Cleopatra was certainly a, a dark lady. She was also thought to be the richest person in the world at the time, and she is described here as fortunately fortunate. Well, fortunate, of course, is a synonym of rich, so she seems to be being described as richly rich, and she has a margin note, Lucretia, which I've just explained, means rich, coming from lucrum in the Latin. So we have rich, richly rich, the richest woman in the world. And don't think for a second, please, that fortunate means lucky. If you read Samuel Daniel's play, it begins with Cleopatra weeping and wailing as she has to give away her illegitimate son, never to be seen again. Once you understand what's going on here, of course, you understand a great deal more about Samuel Daniel's poems and how they play in this great drama of the, of the Shakespeare scandal. Okay, so we found, the, um, we found the fair youth. We seem to have found uh, the dark lady. Can we find, oh dear, can we possibly find uh, the poet? Well, the last word there is Oxford. Can't think what that could mean, but it's the 17th word from the end of the page. And it sits nicely on top of a very strange hyphenated epithet, court dear verse. And that consists of a charade, our de Vere, with a perfect anagram, a secret. So we have our de Vere, a secret, which is lined to a margin note, Sweet Shakespeare, we seem to have found here then, not only uh, the, the fair youth, we found the dark lady, and we found the poet. And now, of course, we know what is meant in this when they are told that uh, infame must register uh, the pedigree of his children in, their, in, their, in his forehead. Now, this is not the only um, uh, contemporary to leak this appalling scandal. Uh, here's another one, never been actually published. This is a manuscript at Hokum. You know, belonging to the Earl of Leicester. And at the very bottom of the page, we have four lines of verse. And I'll just zoom them in there. And you can probably see straight away uh, the word Shakespeare. You can probably notice just above that, nomen ubiqui tuum. Uh, your name is all around. And I'm sure you've noticed just above that, the word via, which means truly in Latin. Just to the left, the word via, which means truly in Latin. And just above that, the word via, which means man in Latin. Now, if I were to be a, a little bit naughty and take that first of those uh, vias to be a pun on the name via, then we can translate that very simply. Noble via, just as roses bloom everywhere, so your name truly brooms all around. Sounds a little bit as we've got some connection to Henry Rosalie and that possibly he might be the father that of all these people being called Via. They shouldn't be called Via, perhaps they should be called Rosalie. Look at that word, Generosa, just after Via. It contains, of course, not only the root of our word genetics of Rose as well, the inherent Rose, Via Generosa. Now we can actually corroborate this when we look at what is said about Shakespeare. So I'll put the Latin up, won't bother to read it. Um, and let's just translate that in the normal way it's translated into English. Will Shakespeare, eloquent poet, there are as many hairs on Athos as your muse has charms, your verse from a rich, inherent vein. Well, epigrams always hiding something saucy, something naughty, they're devilish in their, in their uh, schemes. And we just need to work this one out. Not too difficult to know that hairs are always used as symbols of harlotry and lust. But look at the Latin. We have the word lepores twice in the same line, but actually lepores means two different things. It means hairs in the first instance, and it means charms in the second instance. What would happen though, if we translated this and use lepores to mean the same thing in English both times? There are as many hairs on Athos as your mute has hairs. I think that doesn't mean anything. Shakespeare himself uses that little pun. Hairs is heirs, of course. Your verse, well, we can easily pun that or call it a perfect diagram. A rich, another pun, the name rich, inherent vein. Inherent vein, ingeni vena. As I say, the, the geni, we have now the word genetic, but they didn't know about genes in those days, but we do. They would say inherent vein, it means the same thing, genetic vein. So this little dirty, scurrilous little rhyme says, there are as many hairs on Athos as your muse has heirs your veers from a rich genetic vein. We seem here to be pointing once again at the dark lady, just as we were in 
first of these two, Noble Veer, uh, just as roses truly bloom everywhere, so your name truly blooms all around. So once again, both uh, Thomas Porter, who wrote this, and the previous example I showed you, they both come out of Cambridge University, and they're obviously sharing the same extremely uh, naughty and mischievous gossip. Let us turn to another person who comes out of Cambridge from exactly the same period, John Weaver. And let's look at his epigram 11. Remember, epigrams are saucy, epigrams are naughty. This one is uh, entitled In Spurium Quendum Scriptorum, uh, which means to spurious a certain writer. Spurious, as we all know, means uh, not proceeding from its uh, uh, author or, or supposed author. In other words, we're talking spurious about someone who's using a pseudonym. So can we please hear this nicely read out? Epigram 11. In spurium quendam scriptorum, to spurious a certain writer. Apelles did so paint Venus queen that most supposed he had fair Venus seen. But thy bold rhymes of Venus say so that I dare swear thou dost all Venus know. Lovely. Thank you very much, Eric. And, and it's pretty obvious you can hear the beautifully red way that he put it there. This is telling us that whoever wrote the poem about Venus also seems to have had some sort of sexual affair with Venus. Um, notice that very interesting use of two sets of, of double Vs. So who is spurious? He's epigram 11, the 1-1, one, one, the I-I, I, which is uh, how you represent Gemini in the stars, the twins. So how do we find the double of this spurious writer? Well, the easy way to do it is you double 11 and you go straight to epigram 22. And sure enough, this is to William Shakespeare. And yes, he's written a poem about Venus. And you're going to hear, this is about to be read out, you're going to hear, I think, that uh, Shakespeare is not the author, but someone who they're calling Apollo is the author of these works. But what I want you to do when you're listening to this reading is try and concentrate on that secondary meaning, on what we've now been talking about. Try and see if you can hear how Weaver is telling us that Shakespeare's children are not his children. They are not his issue, they are somebody else's issue, and that they are rosy tainted, they are rose checked, and see what this is to be said about who on earth is the mother of Shakespeare's children. There's a huge undercurrent going on here that ends, I think, in a, in, in a great burst of fury, of indignant Puritan fury, basically saying to Shakespeare, a burn in hell, you and your uh, rotten, dirty, iniquitous uh, family of bastards. Can we hear this poem then? Epigram 22. Ad Guillemum Shakespeare, or to William Shakespeare. Honey tongued Shakespeare, when I saw thine issue, I swore Apollo got them and none other. Their rosy tainted features clothed in tissue, some heaven born goddess said to be their mother. Rose checked Adonis with his amber tresses, fair fire hot Venus charming him to love her, chaste Lucretia virgin like her dresses, proud lust stung Tarquin seeking still to prove, Romare, Richard, more whose names I know not, their sugared tongues and power attractive beauty say they are saints, although what saints they show not. For thousands vows to them subjective duty, they burn in love thy children, Shakespeare. Heat them, go, woe thy muse, more nymphish brood, beget them. Thank you very much. I hope you've got some of the inner meanings to that. I'm, I'm going to wrap up now. I'm going to take you away from the 1590s. All those examples I've given you are from the great area of this scandal, the 1590s, when the sonnets were uh, written. I've left two uh, which are from the 1590s that also tell you exactly the same names, exactly the same people, exactly what's going on. That, one of those is a great poem called Willoughby, His Avisa, and another one is something called uh, the 
envoy to Narcissus by a man called Edwards, but we don't have time to look at those, but they do, I promise you, confirm what I've been talking from these other gossip mongers. I'm gonna skip you forward 30 years uh, to a book published in 1639 to two epigrams by a man called Thomas Bancroft. Now, these are gonna be read out for us. And what I would like you to do when you're listening to this is once again, try to go beneath the surface and use the dirtiest part of your dirty mind to see if you can find every single word or as many words as you can that have a subtext, a lewd, licentious subtext. I'm gonna give you a tiny bit of help just with the, the first line uh, here. And thou shalt ever after loathe the sugared cakes the bewitching dainties of lustful affections. Uh, amidst thy dainties, thy chastity is in danger, and uh, hunger seek food, but lust dainties. Okay, with that in mind, let's hear these two epigrams by Thomas Bancroft to Shakespeare. To Shakespeare. Thy mused sugar dainties seem to us like the famed apples of old Tantalus. For we, admiring, see and hear thy strains, but none I see or hear those sweets attains. To the same, thou hast so used thy pen or shook thy spear that poets startle, nor thy wit come near. Thank you very much for that marvelously lewd rendition, Richard. Uh, thou hast used thy pen, that poets startle, nor thy wit come near. Shake, spear, but be silent in thy praise. I'm afraid I think that is all I have time for. Thank you very much. Alexander, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I kind of feel dirty after that. That was filthy. <laughs> Shame on you. It was. Pornography on a Saturday night. And um, yeah, our three, our three actors were um, yeah, in the right mood for it as well. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Um, probably it's best that uh, I say to everybody who's watching that, um, it's been recorded, and I say that because uh, I think you would agree it was so full, such a rich presentation. There's so much information and so much insight there that it will certainly need a second viewing. So um, given the time constraints, Alexander, if you don't mind, um, you'll see that there are one or two questions there for you. There's lots and lots of very positive comments uh, about it. So. Thank you so much for that. Can I just quickly say, um, Bill, uh, that um, some of this material is, is gone into in greater length on a channel which I have on YouTube. So if people want to check it out there, they can. And the second thing I would say is I'm not at all worried if people want to write, what an ass, what a fool, that's all balls. <laughs> 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 well, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I, I still feel a bit dirty after all of that. However, um, Wonderful, really, really wonderful. Thank you uh, 